Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last session of the inaugural symposium hosted by the Clinic for Asylum, Refugee and Immigrant Services, CARES, at the Villanova University Charles Widger School of Law. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Lydia Shields, and I'm a student in the CARES Clinic and organizer of this panel, a conversation between Reverend Dosha and R. Stanton Jones. Before we begin, I have a few quick announcements. First, if you have a question for the panelists or a logistical question during the program, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Second, we are providing one free CLE credit for this panel, thanks to a generous gift from our donor, Joseph Azrak. If you are seeking CLE credit for this panel, you will need to fill out a course evaluation. It will be sent by the end of the program today and is due back by tomorrow at the end of the day. Only those who registered for this panel will receive the course evaluation needed to get CLE credit. If you are attending but didn't register yet, please send us a note in the Q&A so we can make sure you get the course evaluation. In the course evaluation, you will be asked for two secret words to help verify attendance. These words will be given out during the program and it is your responsibility to write them down. Per the Pennsylvania CLE board rules, Villanova is not allowed to share the words with you if you miss them. Lastly, we created a resources page with links to relevant articles and other information related to the topic of this panel. The recordings and sketch note graphics from the previous panels are also now available on this page. The link to the website is posted in the chat and will be emailed to you after the symposium. Now I will turn it over to the panelists to introduce each other. Thank you so much, Lydia. And thank you to everyone who's invited us to be here today. My name is Kaji Dosha. People call me Pastor Kaji. And I'm joined by my lawyer and friend, Stanton Jones, who we'll hear from in just a second. I just wanted to set the scene for what we plan to do in this conversation. So we have been asked to talk about immigration advocacy spaces and unlikely partnerships in that work. And because we work closely together so much, we thought it would be interesting if just the two of us talked and interviewed each other. So we have a couple of questions that we know that we're gonna ask each other, but otherwise things will just be fresh, which I think keeps things much more interesting. So what we wanted to do now is to introduce each other and Stanton's gonna go first. Thank you to everybody who has collaborated and put this together for us. We're really grateful to be here. Excellent. I'm Stanton Jones. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks to everyone uh, for joining and for putting this together. Um, I'm thrilled to be joined also by Pastor Kaji Spellman Dosha, who is the first woman and also the first Black woman to serve as the head of her 212 year old congregation, the Park Avenue Christian Church in Manhattan. And for the past 12 years, Pastor Kaji has also served as co-chair of the New Sanctuary Coalition, which is a faith-based organization that models sanctuary as a way of life. Uh, and, and it's a group that's very effective at stopping injustices like deportation uh, by channeling the power of love and community over evil. Pastor Kaji is known for her work in building uh, volunteer networks of thousands of immigrant-led advocates across the country. And it is because of this work that she does, particularly at the southern border, that Pastor Kaji um, last year landed on the Department of Homeland Security's targeting list uh, known in the media as Operation Secure Line. Uh, and this was after a, a whistleblower within DHS um, revealed that uh, the department was tracking, surveilling, and retaliating against um, people, including Pastor Kaji, whose uh, speech, and in her case, ministry uh, and sacramental obligations were flagged as a threat uh, to the current administration. And uh, I'm thrilled also that uh, I and my colleagues at Arnold and Porter and our um, co-counsel at the nonprofit organization Protect Democracy are representing Pastor Kaji as her legal counsel um, in her lawsuit against uh, the Department of Homeland Security and ICE 
and CBP, which is uh, captioned DOSHA versus the Department of Homeland Security, an, an apt uh, title. Uh, and I'm also very proud to count Pastor Kaji as a great friend. So I'll turn it over to her. Thank you so much, Stanton. So Stanton Jones is a partner in the Supreme Court practice at Arnold and Porter in DC. And in recent years, he has handled some of the most high stakes politically charged cases really in this country. And his lawsuits have struck down voter ID laws and gerrymandered political maps and restored voting rights to people with felony convictions. Other than voting rights work, Stanton also focuses on high impact litigation. And he represents me in the lawsuit as he, uh, as he mentioned, and he represents my dear friend, Ravi Rugbeer, who is the coalition which I co-chair in Ravi's First Amendment lawsuit challenging retaliatory deportations. He also represents Yasmin Juarez, who is a young mom whose infant daughter died as a result of medical neglect in ICE family detention, as well as scores of parents and children who were separated in 2018 under Trump's evil family separation policy and they are seeking financial compensation from the US government for the trauma that's been inflicted on them. And beyond all this, as he mentioned, uh, he's one of my nearest and dearest friends. So that is who we are. And I guess I'm doing the first question. So Stanton, can you tell us about how you became involved in work with immigrants and with immigration advocates? And just explain you know, beyond what we've already said, what you're doing in this space and what motivated you to get involved. Yeah, absolutely. So it was really um, with uh, Trump's election in 2016 that I decided to uh, make a concerted effort to devote a lot of my uh, pro bono time to working on immigrant rights uh, litigation. I've, I've always done lots of pro bono work of, of various sorts um, but particularly in the wake of the 2016 election, um, I decided that, that immigrant rights and voting rights would be the sort of two spaces where I would focus and channel my energy and work. Um, and in terms of, you know, how did I get involved and, and what, are, what are we doing? Um, I, I work with a, a really great uh, and close group of colleagues at Arnold and Porter. And, and one of the things that we like to do is really challenge each other to come up with creative or what we like to call wacky ideas for lawsuits and then go out and just see if we can make them happen, um, turn them into a reality. And a lot of the projects that, um, that I'm working on in the immigration space are, are the results of those sorts of, of collaboration with colleagues. Um, for instance, working on, on Ravi Ragbir's case um, was the product of just getting an email from a colleague one set of Saturday afternoon he had forwarded me um, a news article uh, with a heading, something along the lines of um, uh, ICE is trying to deport one of the nation's leading immigrant rights activists uh, in retaliation for his, uh, for his advocacy work. Um, and my response was, that obviously violates the First Amendment. Let's go get in touch with him and his lawyers uh, and offer to represent him pro bono and bring a lawsuit. And, um, and we did that. Um, turns out people are actually pretty easy to, you know, you can, it's easy to find out who represents someone and, and to just get in touch with them and, and offer uh, free legal services. Um, our work on the family separation cases grew out of a, a sort of a similar situation. You know, we were, a group of us were just sitting around, I guess this would have been uh, the spring, late spring of 2018, at lunch one day, talking about the family separation, which had just broken in the news um, and was a pretty hot button topic and just brainstorming um, things that we could do to get involved. There was already a lawsuit um, brought by ACLU seeking to reunite families and children, which was understandably and rightly everyone's first focus. But we decided that our contribution could be uh, to bring money damages lawsuits, seeking millions of dollars in financial compensation from the United States government um, for the uh, deliberate mistreatment of parents and children. And so uh, 
months later, we eventually got connected to uh, scores. Now it's actually, I think, hundreds of uh, separated parents and children. And we've brought uh, lawsuits against the United States government under the Federal Tort Claims Act, asserting claims for intentional infliction of emotional distress um, on the basis of essentially uh, kidnapping. And so, um, yeah, all, all of the work that I've done in this space has really been a product of, of just, you know, my colleagues and I pushing each other to try to figure out, you know, what can we do that's creative and, and different um, to really make a big impact in the space. So um, let me ask you, Pastor Kaji, uh, a, a similar question. Tell, tell, tell us about how you got involved with, um, with immigrant rights, immigrant advocacy. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily think of it as like the most natural, obvious connection um, for a pastor. So curious how you got involved and what motivated you there. Yeah, I mean, it actually was just because of, of my pastoral ministry. So I was serving a church in Midtown Manhattan and just on the corner of by, the church was at, is at 54th and Lex, Lexington Avenue here in Midtown, very busy part of the city. And then just like a block away, there was a man named Salim uh, who had a table where he would sell children's books. And I got to know Salim because he was a wonderful person and also because he was part of our community lunch program which would help to serve lunch and breakfast to folks who were facing food insecurity so as we got to know each other and i would just see him every day walking into the church at some point he shared with me that he was all of a sudden under the obama administration's crackdown of people who had criminal convictions being, you know, facing deportation proceedings. And this was the first time I had ever encountered anything like this. And this was, I would say about 13, 12, 13 years ago. So I started going to every advocacy organization I could find to find Salim help. But because he had this minor criminal conviction, which was from using a stolen credit card that someone had like sold him for $10 and he didn't even realize it was stolen, uh, he was now facing deportation, but nobody would touch him because of that criminal conviction. So I went everywhere I could. And then finally, the only place that responded and said, yes, indeed, we will help him was New Sanctuary, was, which was this baby organization at that point. It was very new. It grew out of the sanctuary movement that had started in the 1980s and at the southern border and Pastor John Fife, a Presbyterian pastor, Juan Carlos Ruiz, a former Roman Catholic who's now Lutheran, and so many others had done such beautiful work in the sanctuary movement. And Juan Carlos and others had brought that energy to New York City to have a new sanctuary coalition formed. And so when that happened, I got to know Ruby Rugbeer, who was emerging as the executive director of the organization, Ravi, who we've mentioned before. And that just, I fell into the work, honestly, trying to help Salim. And then once I saw that Salim wasn't the only person who needed help, but you know, many people did. And there wasn't really an organization doing anything like what we were doing, especially from faith-based organizing to support people facing these deportations. and because of course deportation is the original family separation that ICE has done. So yeah, from there we grew this tiny organization that accompanied I think initially like two people, three people, and then went up to about 20. Uh, and they asked me to be co-chair about 12 years ago. And I've been doing that off and on for the whole time I've been in New York City. So that's how I fell into the work and now my goodness, I mean, it's just, it is the air I breathe. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of hard to describe what we do, but it's basically accompanying our friends who are migrants who are facing various issues with ICE that have emerged and evolved over time. And we really believe in pulling together unlikely coalitions and partnerships. So I don't know, I mean, as I do this work, many lawyers who I'm working with are not used to working with clergy. And uh, that's been an interesting 
road to walk. And we just operate from these principles that we do no harm, that we respect people, and we don't judge them. So that's, that's my uh, summary of my work. I guess we could also say that I did work in the, we did come up with the concept of the sanctuary caravan, which brought hundreds of faith leaders and other people of faith down to our southern border in San Diego and Tijuana to meet witness and accompany migrants of the so-called migrant caravan. Oh gosh, and timing, Stanton knows the timing better than I do, but it was sometime in the winter, like I think it was 2018 into 19. It was, it was right before the November 2018 elections, because you'll recall that there was a heavy focus on making the, uh, the, uh, the migrant caravan a big election issue. Yes. Yeah, all the time in my head has just sort of melded together, but it's his job to have more of a sense of when all, things All time in my head is connected to which election cycle was it. <laughs> right, exactly. So yeah, that, that's what I do. Other than that, I'm a pastor and a mom and you know, I try to serve my people. And it unfortunately, because of the government, government crackdown on my ministry, it has impacted people I serve. I, I don't necessarily feel <clears throat> like I am as safe as I used to be because I'm always concerned about government surveillance and, and ways that they may retaliate against the people I, I serve. So that's been an issue, but thankfully, yeah, go ahead. So one of the things you mentioned is that um, your your work in the immigration space started under the Obama administration, and and that's something that's different than for me. Like I said, you know, I, I had generally sort of been interested in immigration and would certainly have described myself as supporting immigrants' rights, et cetera, before Trump. Um, but I really didn't do a lot of work in the space, and you know, it's something that's really jumped out. The more work I've done, and the more I've learned. Um, it's made me realize how completely asleep at the switch I was on these issues during the Obama-Biden administration. Um, the Obama, look, I think Trump has quite clearly taken um, the anti-immigrant policies and, and rhetoric and all the rest of it to a new level, but the, the Obama-Biden administration in many ways was not good on immigration issues. Um, and, and one that's really hit home for me is um, you know, my, my client, Yasmin Farez, whose um, infant daughter died as a result of getting sick in, in ICE detention, they were in family detention. They were, so they were not separated. They were held together in, a, in what's known as a family detention facility. And that concept of detaining parents and children together um, rather than, than just um, allowing them, you know, releasing them essentially on personal recognizance was something that the Obama Biden administration um, adopted as at least a large scale policy for the first time um, around 2013, 2014, when there was a large um, influx of, of migrants from Central America. And, and so one thing that I've thought about and curious what your perspective on it is, is, you know, I, I certainly personally am committed to continuing to stay just as focused on these issues come uh, January 28th or inauguration day, um, assume if, if there's uh, a Biden administration. But what do you think it'll take on a broader scale for, for people to not grow complacent again, just because it's not going to be, you're not going to have a, a travel ban with people protesting at airports. You're, you're not going to have something as extreme as family separation. But um, without people, you know, in, in a big way, continuing to remain focused on these issues, I would worry about backsliding into um, some of the less immigrant friendly policies that we saw under the prior administration. What do you think it will take for people to stay, uh, stay focused? Well, I guess that would assume that they are focused now. I think one of the things that we struggle with and one of my jobs as a faith leader is to both articulate things that are right and wrong and then to make people care about them. And what we've seen is that with the constant, you know, percussive flow of terrible news and terrible things that the administration 
administrations do, it's not always all that easy to get people's attention about it. And part of my job and part of faith leaders jobs and other community leaders jobs is to keep that uh, on people's radars. And I think that, you know, having started this 12 years ago and talked about it for years and years, nobody really cared. And we've been out here sounding the alarms forever, you know, and, you know, I'm even late to the game for many people, but if it didn't hit them or touch them, they didn't really care. And so particularly, I think around the just nefarious, craven policies we've seen as Steve Miller crawls out of his crypt every day and decides how he wants to torture immigrants, I think we are starting to see that people are starting to care and to keep that energy up, to keep the stories up, and particularly in a Biden administration, if we wind up having one, we can't be complacent about it and say, oh, this is all done. There's a lot that has to be reversed. It cannot hinge on whether or not there's a criminal background in people's experience, especially knowing how black and brown people are you know, over-policed. And so it's all stacked against us in the white supremacist plan to keep white people in charge of the country. Immigration is a big piece of that. And so I think, all of us doing our own work, wherever we sit in you know, proximity to whiteness will mean like on every level, holding whatever administration we have and whatever means we have accountable. And part of that has to be public campaign. So like what you and I talk about all the time is that lawyers need to stop just talking to lawyers because some of what you know is helpful for us and see is helpful for us to get the word out about to keep public pressure up. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this panel is just to say, you know, talk to people who you wouldn't think you would collaborate with typically, because that's the only way we're going to do it. One of the things, reasons we did the sanctuary caravan was of course to be responsive to what was happening at the Southern border. And particularly as we were concerned that militias and, you know, vigilantes would be showing up and harming our friends and who were migrants showing up the border. We also realized that it was an opportunity to get faith leaders and others who never really have been involved in the space to see with their own eyes. That's the witness piece because we were meet witnessing and accompanying. People just don't care in the same way until it hits home for them. And sometimes you just have to see it with your own eyes instead of it just being a news story. So I think the next question is mine. Does, does that answer your question enough, yeah. Stanton? No, it does. Okay. it does. So, okay, this next question is just, a, <laughs> it's multi-part, so I'm gonna have follow-up for you on this. Uh, but anyway, I understand that we have a plurality of viewers, including lawyers and pedagogues and students and community activists and clergy as well. So this question could speak to any of the groups, but I want to focus particularly on students and anyone who's discerning the call of what's next in their career. So I would say, you know, without a doubt, you're quietly engaged. I think you have like 10 Twitter followers, but you're very quietly engaged in some of the most influential high impact litigation in the country right now. And can you tell people like, how did you get, how did you learn the skills that you needed to become an expert in these areas? And as you talk about it, uh, I would also love to hear how you find collaborative partners, like how you decide who you're going to work with and, and how did you, yeah, how did you prepare these specialties? Yeah, so um, certainly having great mentors is, is a huge part of it. Um, and, and a piece of that is luck, but a piece of it is, is um, being proactive and, and seeking out opportunities to work with people who are doing um, the, the type of work that you want to be doing. And for me, as a sort of baby lawyer, I was interested in, in working on high profile, high impact litigation. So one of the very early matters that I uh, worked on was the challenge to Pennsylvania's voter ID law. Um, uh, if you're a law student now, you, you might uh, not remember, but back in 
uh, in 2012, 2011, 2012, Pennsylvania enacted a very strict photo, photo voter ID law. And, um, and the sort of lead sponsor of the law was caught on camera saying that, that, that their voter ID law was going to allow Mitt Romney to, to beat Obama in the presidential election. So we challenged that and we pursued a, um, a pretty novel strategy of prior challenges to, to voter ID laws in federal court um, had, had failed uh, the US Supreme Court in decision, many of you may know Crawford v. Marion County upheld them. So we went um, and challenged Pennsylvania's law in the Pennsylvania state courts uh, exclusively under the Pennsylvania constitution. And we were successful in striking that down. And, and just as a, as a function of getting attached to that case and, and really throwing myself into it, um, it was led by just these amazing, uh, brilliant strategists, trial lawyers, uh, appellate lawyers. The, the case was ping-ponging back and forth between trial and appellate courts. And so it was just an amazing experience. And, and since then, I've really tried to sort of model that, always looking for opportunities to, um, to get involved in, in big, high-impact cases um, and really push, push the envelope in terms of legal theories and legal strategies, trying to find ways um, to have success um, where, where others have failed. Um, and, and another example is our, our partisan gerrymandering um, litigation. Partisan, you know, we, we sat down to look at partisan gerrymandering a few years ago, and um, we projected that eventually the US Supreme Court would, would throw out all the claims, would never actually allow um, a gerrymandered map to be struck down and replaced in federal courts. And unfortunately, that turned out to be a, an accurate prediction. Um, but we, as a result, chose to, to pursue a litigation strategy, again, through state courts and state constitutions. Um, and that was successful in striking down maps in, uh, in Pennsylvania and, and North Carolina. I think, you know, the, the Ruby Rogbeer case is another example. Um, you know, I described sort of reading a, a news article about his situation and immediately having this reaction that, well, that obviously violates the, the First Amendment. Um, I still like my gut instinct on it, but as I dug in, it turns out that there's a, there's a U.S. Supreme Court case um, that uh, by and large rejected these sorts of First Amendment uh, immigration retaliation claims. And there was a federal statute that said federal courts don't have any jurisdiction to hear the claims in the first place. Um, uh, I think, you know, if I'd come to it from a different perspective, I might have read those materials and thought, well, this is just sort of DOA. Um, there's a, you know, Supreme Court case that's, you know, looks pretty closely on point and a jurisdiction stripping statute, what can we do? Um, but you know, coming at it the way I do, we decided, no, forget it. Like, let's just try to get around the, the Supreme Court case and argue that the jurisdiction stri uh, stripping statute is itself unconstitutional. Um, and that all ended up, uh, that all ended up holding up. So um, yeah, tr try to find great, the best people doing the type of work you want and then just follow their lead. That's great. And I do have follow up for you. But first, there are many people who are anxious about getting their little code. So let's make sure they do. Yes, for everyone who wants or who is seeking a CLE credit, the first secret word is scarecrow, as in the scarecrow is made of straw. Again, the secret word is scarecrow. Thank you so much, Lydia. And sorry, uh, you know, sometimes I get excited about these topics and forget about important things like that. So we want everybody to get their credits. Okay, so I also wanted to follow up with this because there's a, just your story and background is really interesting. And I think it'll be, I think it would be helpful for you to share a little bit just about what you were doing before you became an attorney. Yeah, I, I won't, I, I won't say more. You could, you could do that yourself. So uh, before law school, I was working construction. <laughs> uh, but before that, I was, uh, I was teaching elementary school in, in Baltimore City um, through, through Teach for America, uh, which was um, a really eye-opening experience um, and also incredibly hard work. Um, I think being a teacher, particularly being a teacher in, in types of schools that Teach for America serves, 
is uh, about the hardest job out there. Uh, and it made both law school and frankly, every single day of being a lawyer seem uh, relatively like a vacation day. Um, I, I, to, to this day, like on my worst days as a lawyer, my hardest days, suffering the biggest losses, having the you know other five side file the scariest motions, whatever it is, um, I can I can still retreat back to um, well this is still today's still a lot easier than my easiest day as a teacher, um, and so just having a, a space like that to uh, to go to for sort of peace of mind. Yeah, and I, the last thing I wanted to ask and, and follow up about just your background and how you've gotten here is one of the things that I know you've seen. So what? What viewer you don't know is that Stanton does represent me in this big case, but also in much smaller matters as they come up. Like he's my lawyer, and then they're in my capacity as CEO. I just have a lot of legal stuff I have to deal with. But before you became my lawyer, I had a really tough time with the dozens of attorneys representing me on various matters, getting them to take my perspective seriously. And I think a piece of that was that we didn't share these attorneys and I just didn't share a cultural background. And, and one of the things that's very interesting in working with you is that we kind of come from exactly the same, almost exactly the same background, um, you know, as specific as like we were the light skinned black kids at elite private schools in Maryland. Like there's a whole way of code switching that just comes from that kind of background. And what's interesting, especially with your proximity to whiteness, is that you wind up being like the interpreter for me uh, in these, you know, legal spaces. And it occurs to me that for most clients, who would be Arnold and Porter clients or any any of these big firms, they have people who represent their cultural backgrounds very easily because they're mostly white firms. But like, what does it mean to have most legal representatives? not from these uh, ethnic minority backgrounds, so-called. And what have you seen in these like bicultural spaces that uh, where a lot of people don't even realize you're black or have a black daddy? Yeah, um, you know, I, I remember one conversation we were having when your church was having basically a commercial real estate dispute. So nothing having to do with uh, civil rights or rights of any kind, just a very plain vanilla commercial real estate dispute. And, and you were complaining that the lawyers, the, the, the commercial real estate lawyers didn't, weren't speaking your language. They weren't sort of getting your perspective. They weren't understanding the, the um, sort of energy and themes that you wanted to, to develop on behalf of the church. And I remember, I think I said something like, oh, like you just need a, a big law firm commercial real estate lawyer who also is like a social justice advocate like warrior except that's like a that's like a unicorn of sorts um so uh yeah it's just the the things don't sort of often go together you know um i i do find you know certainly working in um in a big law firm it's a it's a space that is you know overwhelmingly white um and um you know, we, we try to improve that where we can by, you know, promoting within our group, promoting diverse lawyers. Um, but no, there's, there's no denying that working in a big law firm and working in the law generally um, is, is a very white space. Can you say something about like, I'm trying to ask these questions without saying too much, but about how, as a person of color, learning how to figure out how to navigate like the office politics and, and everything that it takes to get to the point where you are, where you're a partner and you can advocate for the kinds of cases you're gonna take, kind of work you're gonna do, kind of clients you'll have in ways that associates who are kind of up going up the line don't have. Just can you say something about how anyone who considers themselves to be a non-white person of color might be able to figure out how to best navigate that if they're interested in big law? 
Yeah, I mean, one, one of the great things about being a partner in a big law firm is I, I do have the ability to um, choose the types of matters that we take on. And, and you know, when I and, and I've chosen um, through my pro bono work and, and my firm and my group does a ton of pro bono work, um, primarily to advocate causes that whether it's in the immigration space or the voting rights space, um, sort of on the whole big picture is right promoting racial justice um, and um, and yeah law, law firms have a lot of resources um, and they represent a lot of commercial clients and just do plain vanilla commercial work but they also have a huge amount of resources um, and you know having the ability to direct substantial resources in terms of person power and money um, to racial justice causes um, that are important to me is, is, uh, is fantastic. Well, you know, a bunch of movement advocates really have a, which I'm sure you know, have a critique of lawyers in big law sort of stepping in on some of these big cases. They're like, why don't they just give us the money and <laughs> let us do this work? What, could you say a little bit more about how you see that best working in that collaboration? Because I imagine that in the advocacy spaces, even though many of those are also overwhelmingly right, white rather, and, um, and sometimes even often kind of racist, um, you still are more likely to have people directing that legal advocacy who are people of color as opposed to at big law firms. Like what, how does that interplay work? I mean, well, what we found is that the, the best legal work um, comes through productive collaboration uh, with teams and, um, you know, white or, or people of color, that there are excellent lawyers at, at law firms. Um, and winning lawsuits uh, of any sort requires top-notch lawyering. Um, and so, you know, we always strive to create, um, what we call like a virtual law firm on our teams, you know, when it's people from my, from my firm, along with whether it's people from another firm or people from um, the ACLU or um, our co-counsel from the NYU Immigrant Rights Project in, um, in Ravi's case or Protect Democracy in your case. Um, we just do our best to, to integrate as one sort of unified team and, and divvy up responsibilities um, within the team. So you've asked me a few questions. Let me switch and ask you a, you a couple. Um, so in some ways, I, I think of a pastor as having a lot of sort of traditional functions. Um, and yet I would describe much of the work that you do um, as at least to my mind, fairly non-traditional. And in some instances, um, you know, I might even describe it as aggressive or, or risky. Um, I'm thinking, you know, in particular about your work with No More Deaths um, and, and other sort of actions. Um, how have you been able to position yourself um, as a pastor, the senior pastor of, you know, a sort of well-established church sort of in long-standing institution how have you been able to position yourself in that role to take on these um edgier projects um, yeah. and how do you balance that edgier work or riskier work with your more traditional pastoral duties and role at the church yeah a, a lot of people ask me this and and it is true that my pastoral life is quite different from most of my colleagues who are in the ministry, although that's changing and it feels good to have other folks really digging deeper into this, a new generation of people who are, are finding their way into what you might consider more radical or risk-taking perspectives. And for most people, I would say that many, and this could be in pastoral ministry or just anywhere across our careers, many of us make choices about how much risk we're gonna take based on how much risk we can take or perceive ourselves to be able to take. And, and our employers often have a big, huge role in, in determining that. I happen to currently serve Park Avenue Christian Church, which is entirely supportive of my ministry. But had I tried this in 
that to the degree that I do it now in just about any other congregation I'd served, I'd, I'd be fired. And <laughs> just, they would get rid of me because much of what church as institution is willing to do is much about self-preservation and about upkeeping the institution. So when you start to push in ways that compromises what they consider to be their institutional integrity, by doing things that they're not used to doing, then it can be very difficult to have a sustained and supported ministry. Like people want to see you showing up to the things that the last pastor did and, and there's all, all that sort of thing. So that happens to not be the case at my current, at my church, which I hope to stay at forever, honestly. And they expect me to be a public theologian, a an ethicist, a person who's out front on a lot of issues, and to help the congregation to figure out how it then can also, you know, from various perspectives, support ministries that don't just look at the world and talk about it, but actually change it. And in order to change it, we have to be willing to go and take like bold moves and strong steps. And there's so much that's wrong right now. Any institution that just sticks with what it's been up to is complicit in upholding so much evil. I mean, church too, or church especially. So again, when we're the ones who are responsible for naming and claiming what is right and what is wrong, as many people look to faith leaders to do, if we are too worried about like a major donor walking away from the church because that's how we keep the lights on, if we're too worried about any of those things, then that's how you get most of the clergy you know and see. And I am just very blessed to be in a space where that's that's not the case. I'd say that's how I got there. But like I said, I mean, I learned how to play the game by growing up in white spaces as a, you know, as the proximate to white, light skinned black kid in elite places that taught me how to talk to white people without getting them too mad. Now I don't care, but before I did, and that's how I got to where I am. I wouldn't be the pastor of a large steeple Manhattan congregation if I hadn't known how to make those navigating steps. But now that I'm here, you know, it's it's really incredible to be in a place where my congregation has my back. I think you sent me an email once where you said your denomination has your back. That came from just networking a lot and caring about people a lot sincerely. Like when people talk to me, they're not worried about me lying to them. And I think that builds the kinds of relationships we need to be able to get things done. So that's my answer. Yeah, I think that conversation was when your denomination was filing an amicus curiae brief um, in support of you in your lawsuit. They were they were quite literally coming to your aid as a friend of the as a friend of the court, which was um, which was to me quite remarkable and and risky at an even you know uh, at a different different level for them as an institution. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it sounds like it's been a positive balance, but has there been, have you encountered any conflict or, um, or resistance to borrow a term? Do you ever have uh, congregants ask you or, or question any of the um, sort of act the more um, out front edgier uh, advocate type work that you do? Not in this church. No, I mean, people will have questions about what we're doing how it ties into Jesus. It's so clear though. I mean, people get, they look at, we do serious Bible study. We look at what really, what we understand from a historically critical perspective of what has happened in the history of God and God's people and how you know, liberation was pursued, how salvation comes about. And it all is about risk and it's about fighting empire. And so, yeah, we're a congregation at the corner of 85th and Park Avenue, which is hard, which makes it more affirmatively important for us to take everything that we have and live it out for other people. The congregation has gotten that in this church. Other churches, absolutely, yes, I got, I have always gotten significant pushback, which was how, as I was emerging as a more radical pastoral leader, I really was praying and hoping for a congregation like the park 
because I needed a space where I could be very clear about how I felt God was calling me to lead them and that they wouldn't resist it for that. Like, yes, they can challenge it. I can also be wrong very often, <laughs> you know? So like we talk about that sort of thing, but it's usually more from a perspective of, okay, what's the call? What resources do we have? How can we make it work if we can? And then we try, you know? It's in, in many ways, it's very similar to what you were describing. We, we just think like, what angle can we get at this work in so that we actually have an impact and aren't just like sitting there as a pretty church. My church isn't interested in that. You wanna talk about the reckoning? <laughs> yes, but let's do that when we get down there. Uh, that's uh, yes, we should definitely talk about the reckoning that needs to come. Um, but we're supposed to do Q and A. Are we doing Q and A now? Do we have questions? Let's see. Yeah, Stanton, you've got a question. Um, and if anyone else has more questions, please do drop them in the Q and A. So can you say more about how your legal career brought you to being a partner at a big law firm where most of your caseload now seems to be public interest or pro bono. I'm also not quite sure if that's true, if most of your work, it's what we were talking about, but that's not all you do. You also have very boring clients, I would imagine. Yeah, so, um, so when I went to law school, I thought I wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer. I thought I wanted to be like a public defender um, and uh, just sort of when I dug in, it turned out that that wasn't my primary interest. It wasn't, um, I wanted to go a different route um, you know, I, I largely sort of fell into being at a law firm, um, just because as I'm sure many of you in law school will experience, it's, it's a sort of a fairly natural path and one that schools, uh, generally put people on. Um, I chose Arnold and Porter because of the, um, extensive work, pro bono work, um, that they do, um, and, and the sort of tradition of, of, um, pro bono commitment there. Um, and so I have been incredibly fortunate throughout my whole career um, to, to do just a huge amount, hundreds and hundreds of pro bono hours um, every year. Um, I, I do also have a um, pretty regular uh, or boring, as, as Pastor Kaji called it, uh, commercial practice representing commercial clients um, in all kinds of litigation disputes. Um, the, the two in, in recent years have, have sort of merged more. Um, it turns out there are actually ways to do public interest work on a commercial basis um, because there are sort of moneyed interests out there who, um, who would prefer to have more democratic elections, um, like small d democratic elections, free and fair elections, um, and who are interested in other sort of social justice causes, um, but not from a sort of purely traditional law firm pro bono um, perspective. Thanks, Stanton. And okay, someone else has asked, and again, if you have more questions you wanna drop in, please do. This is like the Q&A time, but what does the future look like in the work that we are doing together? And I would start to answer that question. I'd love to hear your response. Yeah, so go ahead. But I would say that as we work more together, we learn more how the other is helpful in the work we do. And I think it's more obvious for, for me because Stanton basically comes in and resolves my big issues. <laughs> That's just generally what he does in my life as my attorney on, in a number of ways. But um, I think Stanton is just starting to learn the ways that I can be helpful to him in his work. And, um, and there are a few. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I have found honestly through my work representing uh, you and also uh, Ravi that, um, you know, obviously there's sort of the, the basic lawyer role that I play, right? I give, I give you legal advice. I'm handling your litigation same for Ravi, um, but also find that it's a, a very sort of collaborative um, relationship in terms of, because, because you all have goals that are 
uh, broader and more impactful than just winning the argument or even winning the, the case, or, or, or you might even define winning the case differently than just, you know, putting a W in the win column like some other clients would. Um, so, so thinking more creatively and working collaboratively with you um, to sort of figure out, you know, what, what are your, what are your broader objectives other than just, you know, as a lawyer, I can write a complaint and develop a legal theory and present it to a court and try to get the court to accept it. But, uh, but thinking, thinking bigger picture, um, sort of what do you want to accomplish and how do we, how do we do that together? Yeah. And I would just add to that to just some of the more mechanical things. There are things that pre preachers learn that lawyers really need to learn, especially tri trial lawyers. <laughs> so there have been ways that we have um, been able to work together on that as well. It's just like something, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Yes, yes. Uh, Pastor Kraji taught me to stop saying um so much during my court presentations and various other verbal uh, and physical tics that everybody has um, and that as a lawyer in general, they don't really teach you about, right? There's, there's certainly no, when I, there, I didn't take any class in law school where um, it, was, it was sort of nuts and bolts of public speaking. Um, it's just sort of assumed that you either can or can't speak coherently um, without lots of annoying tics. And so uh, I'm definitely still working on it as I can hear myself saying ah and um, but, uh, but it's a lot better than it, than it used to be. Yeah, that's fun. Okay, uh, someone asked, okay, narratives that shape our church's theological disposition towards activism. So yeah, definitely any of the liberative narratives. I have actually, our congregation is doing a Bible study right now with Park Avenue Synagogue. And what we've really been trying to do is to delve into some of these shaping narratives like the Exodus, like also just like the transition into shaping society, like the the Torah is all about how a group of people came together, tried to figure out what their God wanted them to do, and then they structured their society. And as we go through, and I want to make sure we get to uh, this reckoning that we need to talk about, because this is what Stanton and I are really into right now. But um, as we go through reshaping, or what I would call the apocalypse that we are in the midst of right now, and an apocalypse is you know, often seen as catastrophic, which yes, of course it is, but it's really just like the ending of something major and the beginning of something else. And I do believe that we are seeing that apocalypse right now. Um, we need to figure out like how cultures and societies have, by witness of their faith and their understanding of what their obligation to another person is, we have to rethink this. And as I think, you know, enlightenment thinking is starting to, you know, the self-determination of man at the expense of another is really having its, its last day right now, I hope. And so how is it that we do something new and we use our imaginations to shape something new is something, you know, Stan, he wouldn't articulate it this way, but it's something that we are working on and that our teams are working on, so. Let's see. There's another question here for you, which I would be very interested in your answer, which is for you, uh, is the questioner asks, as a Catholic woman, I'm at once proud of the social justice mission of Catholicism generally, but saddened by the marginalization of women in the church leadership. Um, Pastor Kaji, do you have any wisdom about reconciling the good of organized religion with its failings? I think that we don't reconcile it, actually. We have to leave it behind. I think, you know, there are plenty of ways to encounter God. And when the people who are telling us about God are perpetuating things that are absolutely unjust, like not allowing women into leadership, there's a way to love them as you love perhaps everyone I do, I try, uh, but you don't have to be complicit in upholding those structures that which is not a popular answer and I hate to answer that briefly because it obviously requires much more sophistication and care to the tradition and meaning that, that people derive from these structures but when we keep going or we keep giving 
to an unjust structure, there's no incentive for it to change. So that's my short answer, but I say that with compassion. Feel free to reach out to me and we can talk some more about it, Susan. And it looks like Lydia, did you want to share the last secret word? Yes, the last secret word is November, as in today is November 2nd. Again, the last secret word for the CLE credit is November. So I'm going to ask this question about, I mean, answer the question about working with other denominations and, and faiths in the, in the Q&A. But yes, I do. And we don't always agree on very much. But, uh, you know, from a basic Alinsky sort of organizing principle, we have no permanent friends or enemies. So I'll, but I'll be more specific about that in the chat. So yeah, Stanton, should we talk about the reckoning? Sure. Uh, just to that question, one thing that I'll add from the litigation is that um, in in Ravi's case, in a very short amount of time, no, not in Ravi's case. Actually, in Ravi's case and your case, in a very short amount of time, a group of denominations were able to get together and join in a single amicus brief supporting each of you, which was something that um, sort of I would never have had any window or visibility into how the different denominations communicate with each other. Do they, you know, are they able to sort of team up on things? And it was really impressive to see the way, I mean, we just, all we did was sort of get some lawyers at another law firm who were willing to represent religious denominations generally. Um, and, and then they did all the work together um, just to sort of coalesce around a, an argument that they wanted to present. It was very impressive. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not just denominations, it's definitely across faith groups. I would say some of our closest collaborators are, are from Reformed Jewish congregations, but not only Reform, also conservative and, and so forth. So, okay, so the reckoning. So you want me to kick it off? Okay, so um, lo lots of people in this administration have done lots of bad things and probably or at least perhaps nowhere worse than um, in the area of immigration. Um, I, I think that the family separation policy in 2017 to 2018 in particular um, will be marked as among the worst human rights atrocities committed by the US government on American soil in the nation's history. Um, and, and there are you know, a host of other um, policies that perhaps not as extreme or um, obviously evil um, were, were really horrible and, and just deliberately damaging to, to people and people's lives. Um, what, if when the uh, administration ends and there's a new administration, um, what, what becomes of the people who, um, who conceived of these awful policies, the people who developed them, and then the people who implemented them, and you might think of that as people who implemented them at, you know, at high level policy uh, maker, policy implementer levels, and then, and then all the way down to um, you know, individual could be, uh, you know, detention facility guards who actually took children from parents. How, how do we deal with what happened, um, both from a uh, moral perspective, and, and I think it also could bleed over into a legal perspective? Yeah, I mean, tough to answer this in one minute. Uh, so, uh, what I would say, and we, Stanton and I are available to just hang a little bit longer to talk this through because we do talk a lot about it. Uh, so, I will just say that, you know, if you want to stick around for another five minutes or so, you know, we can talk this through a little bit more. But we have to first determine whether or not we think what happened is okay. Is that a legal question? Is it a moral question? Does it have something to do with laws? haven't been able to be passed. We have to figure out how this happened in the first place. And we also have to see it as just one example that happens to have hit at the heartstrings of people who otherwise have been willing to look away from 
a long stream of this? Like, why was it okay when we determined under the Clinton administration that it's okay for us to do, to do um, deterrence, immigration deterrence through driving people out of the usual ways that they would legally cross back and forth between Mexico and the US, for example, at major cities where there were resources for them to integrate in and, and get jobs and go back to home and come back and forth and then start to do deterrence policies, sending that migration that continues to this day undeterred into the desert where people would die. And that's how I got involved, of course, in supporting what No More Deaths does in, in Arizona. But why is that okay? But then family separation isn't. It's all on the same continuum. And I think we just have to decide as a nation what we believe about what is needing to be protected through our immigration policies. And again, I fully believe that this is all about maintaining just numerically white supremacy in the country. And so if white supremacy is okay, but family separation isn't, we're never gonna get to the reckoning that we need. And we use this phrase because we, you know, a lot of us in, who've been in this space don't necessarily feel comfortable with the language of truth and Recon reconciliation, which of course was a worthy and important collaboration between legal experts and led by Archbishop Desmond Tutu in South Africa, you know, at the, at that time. So how we come together in determining what's okay, what's not, and then how there can be consequences to what people have done because what, where Stanton and I have had some very interesting conversations is that it can't just be like this gentleman's agreement between rich lawyers who just shift around from DOJ to you know, big law. There has to be, a, like you should be a pariah if you were helping to figure out how to disenfranchise, but like anyone tomorrow <laughs> who is gonna do whatever they're gonna do to try to throw out votes, like they shouldn't be able to get a job how do we deal with that? So that's where I start, but Stanton. Yeah, I mean, this issue, uh, it, it, whenever this administration ends, th these questions are going to land in the laps of um, law firms and, and to some degree law schools as well, I think very fast because there's going to be um, an exodus of lawyers leaving uh, government lawyers who, during the Trump administration, participated in ways, you know, big or small, but in many instances, big, in formulating, um, you know, conceiving, formulating, developing, implementing, and defending policies like family separation, and when you know, questions about how is the law firm community nationally, um, and uh, and also, you know, legal academia going to respond um, when people come in. I mean, I just think, you know, one example that I think of from early in the administration was the, the press secretary, whose name I'm gonna blank on now, um, but who lied about the uh, in inauguration crowd size and, and all manner of other things. And when he left the administration, he, I think, took a position at, at Harvard. Um, what, what is his name? Those, those types of, um, Questions will will law, I think law firms and law schools will need to confront those with a significant group of, of lawyers and, and I imagine that it will probably also coincide with you know at the end of the administration. <laughs> um, I, I, I expect that there will be just an onslaught of information coming about out about what actually happened. Um, you know, we've already learned a lot about family separation, but I'm, I'm sure that there's more. Um, from sort of in the bowels of the government, you know, how did it actually happen and who was involved? Um, so, so both sort of at the same time learning more about what people did when they were in, in the administration with respect to these um, really vehemently anti-immigrant policies as they're out there um, in the job market seeking essentially to sort of reintegrate into normal, comfortable um, uh, per, the life of a professional lawyer. And I think where, where we are starting to explore is that if we leave this up to the lawyers, you know, the reckoning, 
then it's going to fall far short of what needs to happen. It needs to be a much broader, this process needs to be a much broader coalition of people who again will define what's right, what isn't, what's okay, how the law may need to change. And also just say like, we were counting on y'all to police yourselves. Like in your case where you saw the, the outright lying um, from the government, like why did those people still have law licenses? I don't get it. If you could say something, you know, they may not know about your case. So uh, I've actually handled multiple cases against the federal government where there has been extensive uh, deceit and dishonesty. Um, one example was the census citizenship question case where we uncovered documents in another lawsuit that we were handling showing that the purpose of the citizenship question um, was not to better enforce the Voting Rights Act, but instead to um, permanently entrench white Republican political control of, uh, of American government. Um, and uh, yeah, there were, there were people who, I think their, we, their testimony was a, a dubious truthfulness at best. Um, and, um, and, and yet they so far have been essentially welcomed back into, um, some of them back into professional life. Um, and similarly, in a more recent case that I'm still handling in challenging the, um, the administration's ban on New Yorkers getting global entry and other trust, trusted traveler programs. And there too, um, the government had to admit several months into the case that its entire legal defense just rested on just a bold faced lie. Um, and they, they had to sort of fall on their sword in a, in a court filing and, and apologize. So I think the fourth or fifth time during handling litigation under the Trump administration that Department of Justice lawyers have had to come and actually outright apologize, like say the words, I am so sorry that this happened to a court. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not normal. No, but meanwhile, like we've got someone we're working with who had a traffic stop, an expired license, and was here on a green card and lied about his name to the officer who pulled him over, then admitted to lying about it, you know, just a few minutes later because he was feeling bad, turned out to be charged with three counts of felony, and now he lost his green card and they're seeking to deport him. I mean, like, why is the only consequence for anything on brown and black people, this is a black man, and not on these fools who are running the country. I just don't get it. Maybe I do, but there needs to be a reckoning. So we, we hope to see it. All right, we're uh, coming up on 10 minutes over. So we should probably wrap up. It has been uh, great talking to you and thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Pastor Kaji and Stanton Jones for sharing your expertise and insight with us on this panel today. And thank you, Sarah, for sharing your incredible talent by creating this amazing live sketch. Um, thank you to everyone for attending. The post-event email with the CLE course evaluation will be sent this afternoon. We will also email the sketch note graphic to all participants and include the link to the website that has additional resources and articles. I hope you guys have a wonderful week.